Let's talk rockets. And in particular, I want to talk about how fast, how easy it is to now build a do-it-yourself, essentially suborbital sounding rocket. Oops. Turn on first here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that it's what we're doing is very much about U.S. centric. There's a lot of this is going to be about your country's regulations on how you can fly rockets. But in the U.S., we can now find that typical solid fuel rocket motors are largely unregulated, up to about 40,000 newton seconds, or a, essentially a small P motor. Um, we have we can fly quite high in collaboration with FAA rule, airspace rules. We can have insured launches up to. Um, well over, well over 60 or 70 kilometers. And we have a rather substantial ability to do mentored rocket building skills. Um, I'm one of those mentors, and we have a whole network of folks that know how to build high-power high, high power rockets. And we have a well-established set of safety rules, which means that now it turns out there's a sweet spot in terms of about 30 to 80 kilometers in altitude for flying CANSAT size payloads that are relatively inexpensive. Um, I'd like to show you a little video. Um, it's kind of fancy because it was done by a high-tech web company that you may recognize about our project and about what we're doing. I think it's enormously liberating to be able to give individuals the power to investigate their world. Technology always starts as something esoteric and expensive, and then it filters down to the masses. And once the masses get a hold of it, we, we do fun things with it. Today we're building a two-stage rocket designed to reach 100,000 feet. John Carmack is sponsoring a competition for amateur rocketry enthusiasts to break 100,000 feet and publish the design for the rocket to help advance the state of the art. We built a two-stage rocket. So you start with one stage that burns for a while. You discard all the extra weight, leaving another rocket that fires again, and it flies the rest of the 80% of the flight. Two-stage was the only way we could reach the altitude we wanted, but it's very difficult to get a successful two-stage flight. The Black Rock Desert is the best place in the world for this kind of rocketry. We've got the biggest piece of nowhere uh, anywhere on Earth. It's a very challenging environment to launch in. There's wind, there's dust, it's hot. It makes life difficult every way it can. You got a pretty cool model rocket out there. It's the Screaming Eagle, it's a little jet fighter. Everyone here is either an engineer or a, a hobbyist who loves getting their hands dirty. Three, two, one. Previously, getting into space has been governments. Now we're moving to the place where individuals can find a way to get close to space, right? We're doing it ourselves as opposed to depending on other people who are doing it. So I think this is a trend of do it yourself. We've got our droid astronaut. He's, uh, he's getting ready for his first flight. We started to see that we could fit a phone in the nose cone of this 100,000 foot design. The phone's got a gyroscope, it's got an accelerometer, it's got a barometer, it's got a GPS. It's got all these sensors that make it sort of like a little miniature satellite that we could conceivably relay that data to a ground station. And that tells us an awful lot about what the rocket is doing in flight. There's only been a handful of amateurs that have gone over 100,000 feet. The highest piece that men have gone to is Everest, which is 29,000 feet. Passenger jet flies roughly about the height of Everest, about 35,000 feet. U-2 spy plane went to 70, 80,000 feet. In order to get to 100,000 feet, we will have to fly roughly at three times the speed of sound, which is Mach 3, roughly about 2,000 miles an hour. That is 50% faster than the fastest military jet aircraft flown by the U.S. today. 
from 100,000 feet, you can start to see the curvature of the Earth. You can see the black of space. It's amazing that I can build something in my basement that gets to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. It's the nearest thing to being an astronaut. We're flying tomorrow morning. Success is guaranteed. <laughs> Did I just say that on camera? Wow. <laughs> Nothing more ecstatic and more frightening, actually, is when something is built that's sitting in the launch pad. Butterflies galore in the last few seconds just before you push the button, because at that point, you're, you don't have any control of it. It's off on its own. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. 20,000 feet. 102,000 feet. Effigy at 104,659 feet at T plus 93 seconds. It turns out the rocket was in hugely rugged country. We would never have found it if I didn't know it was there and if I could look at Google Maps and say that there were actually roads to get there. Here's our guy. <laughs> nothing broken, nothing chipped. He's all good. No, 300,000 feet is the demarcation of space. That's, that's really space. And um, we're not sure if we can get there or not, but we think we can get awfully close. The thrill of this thing compels me to try and go a little better, a little faster, a little higher. <laughs> So what is the technology? How do you build these things? But more importantly, what's it good for? Now that we can, now that it's easy to get there, it's not just governments. You know, we can, I, I can do this multiple times a year. What can we use it for? So I'd like to focus on this discussion group. I'm happy to talk about the technology, but I'd like more interested in saying, what's it good for? Is it good for education? I think it is. Is it good for science? Possibly. We're high enough now that we can actually do real science. So. That's what this group is about. Come if you want to know about rockets. Come if you want to think about how you can build your own suborbital missions. Cheap. Thanks.